Yes, indeed, many people are addicted to pornography. And yes, indeed, many people who regularly indulge in pornography experience challenges in real world romantic interactions. Again, any activity that evokes a lot of dopamine release will make it harder to achieve the same level and certainly the greater level of dopamine through a subsequent interaction. It should become obvious why things like pornography, not just the accessibility of pornography, but the intensity of pornography can negatively shape real world romantic and sexual interactions. This is a serious concern. The discussion is happening now. The underlying neurobiological mechanisms you now understand. This isn't to pass judgment on whether or not people like or don't like pornography. That's an ethical discussion. And it's a moral discussion that has to be decided for each individual by virtue of age, etc. You now understand the mechanisms behind what I'm telling you porn and masturbation. Um, this topic has come up a bunch of times on this podcast because of the relationship between dopamine, uh, sexual motivation, and sexual behavior. And I've been of the pretty strong stance that while I'm not judging porn or masturbation, it can create a brain wiring situation where males in particular essentially teach their brain to be aroused by watching other people have sex as opposed to being the first person actor in sexual uh, interactions. In that sense, um, you know, that's more about the brain wiring and neuroplasticity and dopamine, but what are your thoughts on porn and masturbation as they relate to hormones? I mean, this is a big debate on the internet. In fact, one of the most uh, common debates is whether or not masturbation increases or decreases testosterone in males. Certainly, it will decrease motivation to go find sexual partners. We know this, um, and there are more and more data on this all the time. In terms of the effects of pornography and masturbation, and here I suppose we need to be um, somewhat specific and operationally define what we're talking about. We're talking about porn and masturbation to the point of ejaculation. Right. My understanding is that the ejaculation and, and orgasm associated with it cause an increase in prolactin, which blunts libido for some period of time. The duration of that will vary from person to person and circumstance to circumstance. But basically all of this points to the fact that porn and masturbation can really limit libido in the real world. And to me, uh, pornography and the screen is not the real world. Though screens exist in the real world, the real world doesn't exist in the screen. That's an accurate statement. And prolactin does have a significant occasion acute increase after uh, ejaculation. It does to some degree after orgasm as well, but prolactin acts on the pituitary to inhibit the release of the hormones LH and FSH, of which LH can increase testosterone. So this may be one of the cases where the dose makes the poison. And if it is a very frequent habit, certainly uh, daily or more than once a day would be very detrimental from a hormonal component, not even taking into account the, the neural wiring. And I think it's terrific that you've actually defined frequency because this is the problem on the internet or even in the doctor's office, you'll see um, descriptions about pornography being dangerous for certain things or, or detrimental to hormones. People say frequent, but what's frequent? So you're yeah. saying daily or multiple times per day would be potentially detrimental to the hormone profile of a male of essentially any age. And that's just for masturbation. Uh, with porn use as well, it would likely be worse. Why, why is that? Just this, this, the sort of dopaminergic drive of the stimulus, just the really mm -hmm. intense visual stimulus? Dopamine sensitivity. Um, I think that uh, using the analogy of a dopamine wave pool, it would deepen the pool, but not increase your supply of dopamine. Um, in terms of the other things that all males should do, meaning all males of all ages, um, puberty and beyond, uh, should do, what what are some of those things? So on a daily basis, uh, maybe you could just take us through the arc of a day and, um, and push out some of the protocols that you use or the things that you like to see your male patients use in order to try and optimize their hormone status. I'll briefly touch on some of the lifestyle pillars to start. Diet and exercise are the first two. Um, in puberty, sleep is particularly important, of course. Um, but with diet and exercise, uh, throughout a lifespan, you want to not exclude things that are helping you. For example, during puberty, if you're consuming dairy and then all of a sudden you cut out all dairy, dairy can help increase IGF-1 and free IGF-1. And, and just uh, again is, for our audience, maybe you just mentioned what, IG, what having enough IGF-1 can do for us that's beneficial is. It helps you grow. It uh, helps with uh, genital development, secondary sexual characteristics, and long bone growth, um, skin growth, hair growth, a host of things. So getting an array of nutrients that include dairy, what other sorts of nutrients are important during development? You want to have adequate vitamin D. Vitamin D helps with 
testosterone production. It helps, again, with bone mineralization and stature. Um, after an age of about 25, and there's not a strict cutoff, but up to about an age of 25, optimizing your growth hormone and IGF-1 helps with bone density and bone growth. Uh, from the dietary standpoint, you want to have enough free estrogen, not too much when you're growing, but you want to help basically stockpile bone to prevent a risk of osteoporosis or thin bones fractures when you're older. As someone who broke his left foot five times while in high school, uh, I can say you know, whatever young people can do to optimize their uh, bone density would be great. That problem seems to have resolved itself over time, but I don't know. Back then I was, um, I did a short run as a vegetarian, but I've always been an omnivore. I realize that some of this relates to ethics and food allergies and things of that sort, but would you say that on balance that most people would benefit from eating a combination of, you know, quality proteins from animal sources and non-animal sources, fruits, vegetables, and starches. I mean, what do you think, for instance, about people following a pure carnivore or a very uh, pure vegan diet in their 20s and 30s? In their late 20s, it might be a reasonable option. In early 20s and certainly teens, it is a horrible idea because it is likely to significantly decrease your free androgens. So you will have less testosterone acting on receptors through the body. Are there any other micronutrients or macronutrients that people in their 20s and 30s should emphasize? We haven't really touched on fatty acids or fiber too much. Uh, fiber is going to be paramount in kind of like setting your set point of your gut microbiome the rest of your life. There is prebiotic fiber, which you could think of as fish food for your good gut microbiome. Your gut microbiome is kind of like an aquarium or a fish tank. Now I'm just thinking about goldfish swimming around and that the goldfish eating people don't eat goldfish people. Um, but any fiber or food that you're putting in your gut, it's either going to, it's going to skew your gut microbiome towards something that is more beneficial or, or more detrimental. And would you say that the prebiotic fiber and the getting essential fatty acids, uh, that would be important to do throughout the lifespan or just for people in their 20s and 30s? Throughout the lifespan, um, particularly important in the teenage 20s, 30s, because it helps with brain development. Um, you're certainly more of an expert than me when it comes to um, brain development, but it does continue to de develop th really throughout the lifespan, but certainly through the 20s and 30s as well. About um, taking a multivitamin while you're growing up, so many people um, do that. Uh, is it necessary? Is it useful? And if it's not necessary, is it safe to do anyway? It's generally safe to do anyway. Um, I do not think everybody needs a multivitamin. The more exclusionary your diet is, for example, if you have uh, celiac disease or if you're planning on fertility soon, then perhaps it's more reasonable to take a multivitamin. In a previous discussion of ours, I asked you about um, caloric restriction in testosterone. And if I recall correctly, the idea was that if somebody is overweight, they have excess fat adipose tissue, then getting rid of some of that adipose tissue by, through caloric restriction and exercise, provided it's done not too fast in a healthy way, is going to be beneficial for testosterone in the long run. But that for individuals who are not carrying an excess of body fat, caloric restriction is actually going to lower testosterone. That's correct. Um, if you look at an individual in a caloric deficit, several changes will happen. One is that they'll have less building blocks for hormones. Another is that they will be in a catabolic state more often, so that balance of anabolism and cat catabolism will be different. Different. They'll likely have less signaling from growth hormone and IGF-1. And they'll also have the high SHBG that we defined earlier as the binding protein. So their free androgens and free estrogens will go down. Ready to conquer NoFap? Grab our digital NoFap guide now. End your porn addiction. Skyrocket your self-esteem and achieve your goals. Packed with proven techniques, expert advice, and relapse prevention tricks. Click the link below and break free today. Thank you.